Uh, welcome everybody to this next installment of the UK AEA webinar series during the lockdowns. Um, so today we're going to uh, take a step a little away from the, the general introduction and the hey isn't this all good uh, to uh, answer the question um, what it is that you do every day and how to drive a tokamak. So I'm going to start just by presenting the usual sort of uh, introduction that we usually give to people. So this gives the justification of why we want to do fusion research. We want to limit global warming by producing a form of energy that is not dependent on carbon-based fuels. This we call fusion, the ultimate energy source and uh, the energy source of the future. It's closely related to the physics of stars, but we want to create it here on Earth. It's an amazing technology where we have to heat things up to 10 times hotter than those temperatures found at the center of the sun. And the aim, of course, is to produce sustainable energy future generations. And this is our tagline, of course, fusion is coming. But when I'm taking people round on tours of the facilities, actually at Cullum, quite often I end up with this question. What do you actually do every day? It's all very nice telling us what the end point is, but when you come into work, you sit down at your desk, what is it you're actually doing? So that's the purpose of this webinar today. Um, I'm going to try and answer that question, what, what we actually do, and we'll look at the subject of how to drive a tokamak. I'm David Keeling, I'm a physicist, uh, I've been working at Cullum for some time, and when I'm uh, particularly well behaved they let me drive the tokamak, so this is something that's quite close to my heart. So we'll carry on and see what that all involves. Now of course it's impossible to talk about running an experiment and driving a tokamak if you don't know what a tokamak actually is. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction to fusion and the tokamak design. Uh, if of course you'd like to see a more general introduction to fusion research, there was a lovely talk given a few weeks ago by Nick Walkden. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can catch up on that. But fusion is what powers all stars, including our sun. And the gases in here are heated up to approximately 15 million degrees centigrade. Now to think about what's going on in the sun, we're going to start with a gas. So here's our gas, positively charged nuclei with negatively charged electrons spinning around outside them. And then we're going to get it very, very hot. And when we get a gas extremely hot, we tear apart the structure of these atoms. So we end up with the positively charged nuclei and the negatively charged electrons all independently moving around in a sort of a soup. This is what we call a plasma. So plasma physics is what we're doing. Now, of course, when we've got this plasma, it's all very, very hot. It means that the particles are moving really, really fast. And they're going so fast that occasionally they can overcome the electrostatic repulsion that's keeping them apart, and bang together and fuse to form new particles. Now, the mass of the particles that come out of this reaction is slightly lower than that that went in. So this releases a lot of energy as well. The amount of energy, of course, very famously predicted by this chap, Albert Einstein, and his famous equation E equals mc squared. So we produce a lot of energy with each reaction, and if we can make enough of them, we can use it to form an energy source. Now the problem, of course, is with all these particles moving around randomly, if we just let them do that, they'd fly off in all directions and we wouldn't have a plasma anymore. So we need something that will contain the plasma, some sort of container that will allow us to keep these superheated uh, particles all in close proximity together. So we'll look at this uh, on this slide. So what we have is our, our gas that we've turned into a plasma by getting it very, very hot. So there's all these positively charged and negatively charged particles all flying around. Now, the nice thing about that is because they're all electrically charged, if we add a magnetic field, they will all align themselves to the magnetic field. And to see how that works, we have a little animation here. So what we can see is 
nice straight magnetic field lines and a charged particle which gyrates around that magnetic field. So it's contained within uh, that dimension. There's still a problem here, as you can see, in that uh, if we allow it just to carry on like this, we lose all the particles out the end of the machine. So this isn't providing our containment yet. We just need to do one more thing with that, and that is to bend it round in a circle. So now, rather than flying out the end of the machine, we have particles that will gyrate around that magnetic field line and keep going round and round in a circle. So this shape here, rather reminiscent of a ring donut, is what we call a torus. So that's the mathematical word for a ring donut shape. And that is what we want to try and form at the basis of the tokamak device. So what is a tokamak? Well, here we are. Tokamak is actually an acronym of a Russian phrase. So here's the Russian phrase itself. I'm not going to embarrass myself by uh, trying to pronounce that. It would certainly give my Russian colleagues a good laugh, but uh, I'll leave you to try and work out what it actually sounds like when it's spoken. But what it essentially means is toroidal chamber magnetic field. And this is what goes into uh, making the Tokamak device. This is roughly what it looks like. And in here we have several components. We have toroidal magnetic field coils, so these blue D-shaped coils here, which are producing the magnetic field going round and round the torus, like we just saw in the animation. We also have poloidal magnetic field coils, which we use to shape uh, and position the plasma. But we also need an extra magnetic field. This wasn't drawn on the animation in the previous slide, it's just one extra factor we need. And that the magnetic field we need is shown by these green arrows here. And we get that by using a solenoid transformer up the middle of the machine, which induces a large plasma current, so an electric current actually going round and round inside the machine. And it's that current that generates the extra magnetic field given by the green arrows. And what we end up with is this lovely helical twisty black field line that you can see going round and round the machine. And you can imagine the, the mathematics of working with these things is particularly interesting. That's why we have such a fun time of things when we're doing tokamak research. Of course, those fields aren't the only things that go into making a tokamak. We need several other systems as well, such as fueling. So the fuel we need to put in there in the forms of gas or frozen pellets of hydrogen. Uh, we need magnetic field control, plasma shaping, all connected to feedback circuits to keep it all uh, balanced inside the machine. Power supplies to get all the power off the national grid and into our machine and into our field coils in the right way to make it work. Heating systems, you can see the animation in the bottom left hand corner here, which is a representation of one of our uh, neutral beam particle heating systems. We're also a physics experiment, so we need diagnostics to work out what's actually going on. Here's a picture of one of our laser based diagnostics that tells us what the temperature and density of our plasma is. Data acquisition systems to get the information out of this laser, for example, and into some sort of usable format that the scientists can look at. Uh, and automatic analysis systems that allow us to. So we were back at uh, data analysis. And of course, we've got a lot of uh, heavily industrial machinery. So we need a lot of safety procedures to make sure that we're doing everything safely. And here it is. This is the JET Tokamak, the joint European Taurus, which is the biggest Tokamak in the world and is located at Cullum in the UK where we work. Now I'm privileged to work there and of course this is the Tokamak that uh, I get to drive most often. So this is the one that we're going to be talking about for the rest of uh, this webinar. Now JET is operated, owned and operated by the Eurofusion Consortium. So this is a consortium made up of the EU, UK, Switzerland and Ukraine. Um, and we operate uh, JET Tokamak here in uh, Cullum in the UK. There are several other devices as well, such as West, uh, Aztec, Rendelstein. Um, and not only do we have uh, researchers from these countries, but we have collaborators from all over the world. So this is one of the things I really love about working at Cullum. So uh, walking around at work, you can bump into researchers from all over Europe, from America, China, Japan, Korea, Australia. It's really a lovely place to work, very multicultural with a lot of very interesting and exciting people to work with. So we've got our experimental reactor. We've just seen the inside of JET. What do we actually do with it? Well, every experiment starts off with an idea. 
So here's my little chap, a scientist having an idea. And the idea that we're going to follow uh, through in this webinar is uh, an experiment which was designed to improve the confinement of the plasma, increase the reaction rate, produce a better, um, a better performing plasma for the basis of uh, a power station. So once you've had the idea, you then need to write it up, submit it to the task forces, and try and get formal approval for it. And if it gets formal approval, as in if everyone decides that it's got enough scientific merit to be uh, awarded machine time to run, it will be allocated machine time. Now this part of the process basically means having lots and lots of meetings. We're not going to be talking about this. What we are going to be talking about is this part, the more interesting bit. So the preparation of the machine, what you do in advance of an experimental session. Then when you get into the control room, what do you actually do to set the machine up? Uh, what technical limits uh, there, there are to the operation? Then running the actual pulses. Um, of course, after the experiments run, there's a lot more to do, analysis of data, which then often leads to more, a lot of discussion and possibly ideas for more scientific experiments, and then you go around the loop again. So this is the process of scientific research that we generally follow. But as I said, we're going to be looking at this bit in the middle. There we go. So I'm going to discuss this by looking at the control room. So here's a picture of the control room at Cullum. Um, and you can see there's lots of people there. Now, they don't appear to be doing any work in this picture. That's because they're actually watching one of the experimental pulses running through. Um, an experimental pulse being where we actually turn the machine on, we run the plasma for about 30 seconds, taking measurements, and then it all shuts down again. 30 seconds is about the maximum amount of time we can run an experimental pulse for in jet before everything gets too hot, and we have to shut it down again to cool back down again. So that's what's going on in the picture. But to explain how these people all work, the cooperation, the teamwork of the huge number of people around uh, the rest of the site, I'm going to discuss some of the roles of these people in the control room. So here's a schematic overview of the control room. The picture we just saw was located in the middle here. And you can see several roles that are associated with that area in the middle of the room. So these are the three people who are mainly responsible for uh, getting the experiment run. The engineer in charge, the session leader, and the scientific coordinator. So let's talk a bit more about what they do. Here's the engineer in charge. As the name suggests, this person is in charge of operations. They're mainly concerned with safety. So making sure that the plant is being operated properly, it's within its operational parameters, making sure the personnel are all safe, that nobody is out on plant where they're not supposed to be. They have no role in the science. They're there to make sure the science staff are using the machine properly, and they have the ultimate authority to allow or stop operation. So we have to be really quite nice to them. The next role is the scientific coordinator. So the scientific coordinator is the person who's actually running the experiment. They're the ones who at the beginning had the idea for the experiment, and later they're the ones who will coordinate the analysis of the data and write up the results. So they coordinate the scientific team behind the experiment, uh, and beforehand they will work with the session leader. So although the scientific coordinator is an expert in plasma physics, they don't necessarily have any expertise in setting up the machine. So they work closely with the session leader to agree the machine setup and produce the science that they want to see. So that brings us nicely onto the role of the session leader. The session leader is an expert in setting up the machine and running it. They're the ones who work with the scientific coordinator to design a viable experiment, and they're responsible for setting up all the machine parameters. Uh, during the experimental day, they lead all the operations during the experimental sessions. And of course, they're usually an expert in plasma physics themselves, so they can have some input into the science and give the SC the benefit of their experience. So we talked about these machine parameters. So what are these? What actually needs setting up and deciding on? So we're going to look just a little bit. Of, I've got a few graphs in here that are quite simple, so do bear with me. So these are two of the main parameters we have. We've mentioned them before in the design of the tokamak. But here they are, the plasma current and the toroidal magnetic field. Uh, so we can see on here, you choose, have to choose the ramp up time, the flat top values, 
how these all uh, marry up together and how, uh, how to set those up. Next couple of things, the fueling, what sort of gas you want to put in, what profile, what control methods you need to use to get the right gas into the machine at the right times. And things like the additional heating. So uh, here's the heating early on in the experiment. This is called ohmic heating at this time, where uh, the heating is just from the plasma current that's going around inside the machine. And later on, we turn on our particle beams and a couple of other things that I'll talk about in a moment. And of course, there's quite a bit more besides, which uh, I'm not going to go into because otherwise we'd be here for the rest of the month talking about these things. So here we go, um, just a, a quick overview of the gas system, for example. We have lots of things called GIMs, gas introduction modules. And you can see there's different types of these in different locations. So here's three that inject the mid plane. It's pipes in the roof of the vessel and these rings around the bottom of the vessel. You have to choose exactly which ones of these are coming on at which time, how much gas they're putting in, and of course the locations that they're in have an effect on the physics we see at the end as well. The extra heating systems, so here's part of the neutral beam heating system, uh, consisting of 16 individual particle injectors. So you can see eight of them here. And for an idea of the scale, there's one of our engineers who's inspecting the system from ground level at the bottom left of the photograph. As a schematic, it actually looks like this. So here's our engineer and the injectors that we saw in the photograph, but the rest of the system in blue here is absolutely enormous. This is half of the system. There's an identical bit the other side of the vessel not shown here, but you can see that it's comparable in size to the Tokmak itself. These are really impressive, very large heating systems indeed. We have another type of heating system known as ion cyclotron, ICRH, uh, sometimes also known as RF for radio frequency. So essentially we're creating very powerful radio waves. We have antennae mounted on the inside of the vessel. These are very close to the plasma, which sits about there in the tokamak. And when we turn them on, depending on the magnetic field we've chosen and the frequency that we're broadcasting the power at, we can get resonances and deliver power into very, very specific parts of the plasma. So this is a very controllable heating source. So that's gas and heating. What else do we need to do? Uh, plasma position and shape design. So in this picture, you can see a number of shaping con and control coils in red. So everything in red here is a magnetic field coil that we have to control. We have to decide how to control it. And the reason we want to decide how to control it is that we need to make sure that the plasma is the right shape and it's sitting in the right part of the plasma, sorry, the right part of the vessel, uh, and that we can actually control it all the way through the pulse. So to design these things, we have specialist software tools. So here's a little video of one in operation. You can see we've set up coil currents and plasma parameters in this window at the bottom. When we run it, it starts doing an awful lot of mathematics. Now I've actually shortened this video by about two minutes in terms of the actual runtime. So it does quite a lot more calculations than are shown here. But at the end of it, we can examine what it thinks this particular set of coil currents and plasma parameters is going to give us in terms of a plasma shape. So we can see here, the red line shows what the calculated plasma shape and position will be for that set of coil currents. We can examine the diverter region at the bottom in more detail, because these points here is where an awful lot of the power gets deposited. So we need to make sure these points are placed with millimeter precision. And this tool also allows us to compare different shapes one against the other. So if we don't think it's quite right, we can tweak one of the uh, coil current parameters and have a look at the difference that we might end up with. So you can see here the blue and the red are comparisons of two very slightly different uh, configurations. And you can see the, the, the millimeter or so that we've moved the strike points. All very important stuff when it comes to uh, designing our plasma position and shape control. So here's some of the different things we can do with this. Uh, so on the left, we've got a, a, a low triangularity plasma. It's fairly round. Um, and the strike points in the bottom of the machine. We can move the strike points into different places, uh, like in here. And on the right-hand side, we can see a triangular plasma. So if you compare the right-hand side with the left-hand side, you can see how we've got a nice sharp point at the top of the machine. And the differences between these give us different physics, so different behaviors of plasma. And this is one of the things that we can change to see the science that we need coming out of the experiments that we do. So once we've decided on all these parameters, we need a software tool to actually set the machine up. And this is a 
quick run through of uh, the particular tool that we use. So on this, we set up the plasma current in a box here, the containment field here, the shapes that we've just designed on the previous page here, uh, the timing of all of these, um, and the various control schemes, so how we actually keep those, those uh, plasmas under control. And this is just one of the pages of parameters we need to set up. So if we go along the top, I've just pressed the gas page. So each of these boxes represent one of those gym gas introduction modules with the timing, control schemes, waveforms, et cetera, that define how those work. And then the additional heating, so the neutral beam and the RF and the power waveforms that we're going to use to heat the plasma up during the experiment. And there are many other pages besides, including things that I haven't mentioned at all yet, such as protection systems. So this is an experiment. If it does something that's not quite expected, we need to make sure that the plasma is going to go into a set response that will shut it down safely. So that's all defined on this page, what different things that can happen and uh, how the machine will respond to those. So lots and lots of decisions to be made. So we're nearly ready to go, but there's another role that I didn't mention yet, the diagnostic coordinator. So uh, we're an experiment and we have to be able to take measurements of things to know what's going on. So JET has approximately 100 diagnostic systems um, and it's the role of the diagnostic coordinator to help the SC make sure they're all set up and in the right configuration. Then during, during the experiment, um, they will uh, sit in the control room and make sure everything's configured properly and is taking the data that we need to see. So here's just a quick uh, picture of all those diagnostic systems. I'm not going to go through them. It's just to show you how many there are and what sort of things that we need to be taking care of. But in terms of diagnostics, we'll be taking between 20 and 40 gigabytes of data in every single pulse. We also consume a lot of power. So there's a control room role of power supplies operations engineer. So this is one of our PSOEs sitting at the control desk there. And they're looking after such things as the three supergrid transformers that we have. So you can see the 400 kilovolt supergrid pylon that comes into the back of our site. There's one, two, and can't quite see it out of shot, three supergrid transformers, which take that electricity and push it out across all the other power supplies on site. We have a couple of energy storage flywheels. These things weigh 775 tonnes and are used to uh, smooth out the power demands during an experimental pulse. So this is a picture of during the construction. You can see the people walking around on top of this thing. It really is a monstrous but very impressive piece of engineering. And of course, there are many more power supplies of all different shapes and sizes looked after by a team of very talented engineers. Now the PSOE, is also responsible for monitoring the health of the national grid. So just to illustrate why, I've got this graph from the national grid, which details the grid demand during the England v Germany World Cup game back in 1990. I remember watching this myself, it was quite exciting. And one of the reasons it was exciting was because during the game, we had half time, then full time, it went to extra time and then finished with a momentous penalty shootout. And you can see just after the penalty shootout finished, the demand on the national grid picked up by 2.8 gigawatts. So this is everybody finishing watching the match, going to their kitchen and switching on their kettles. Now this is the biggest world uh, pickup that's ever been experienced by the national grid. JET by comparison has a maximum demand of 575 megawatts. So not nearly the 2.8 gigawatts here, but you can imagine that if the grid was experiencing one of these pickups, and we switched on jet, the grid would be in some serious difficulty. So uh, we have to be very careful and work with the national grid to make sure that everything remains healthy all the time. So we've got everything ready. Uh, we've got the machine set up, the diagnostics are set up, the PSOE has confirmed the grid is in a good state. Let's run a pulse. So here we go. This is the view of a camera pointing into jet. During a pulse, it's a visible light camera, so it comes into color just at that point. We turn the heating systems on, we get the nice exciting hot part of the plasma, and then we finish the experiment and we turn the plasma off at the end. Fantastic, so we've successfully achieved a pulse, but now we need to examine what actually happened and work out uh, if it was a good experiment or not. 
So we'll run that again. And this time we've got uh, the output of part of our diagnostic system here. So this is the magnetics output. We run it through a code to analyze what's going on and it shows us the actual plasma position uh, and shape all the way through the experiment. So great, having examined that, we know that the plasma was the right shape. It was in the right place. It was depositing power in the right places in the diverter. But that's not all, of course. We've got 40 gigabytes of data to look through, remember? So here's a little bit more. And this time we can see the heating systems as they come on together with the uh, plasma current and the field. So you can see the hot part as we go through the heating phase and then the plasma goes out at the end there. So lovely. So now we, we've seen some of the data all matched up with the plasma position, etc. Now at this point, we need to examine that we're not getting anything inside the vessel too hot. So this is an infrared camera view. You can see how the plasma sits in there and where it gets close to the walls, you can see on the infrared view where it's getting the tiles a little bit hot. So again, at the outer edge here, you can see little hot spots. Now 600 degrees is within the limits we're allowed. So although this picture looks a bit nasty, this is actually all within the uh, allowed parameter space of uh, the operations. So that's all good. And then there are other things. So I've picked up on one particular bit, which I love, uh, magnetohydrodynamics. So this is a, a, a phrase which essentially means the study of conducting fluids in magnetic fields. Now, the plasma is the conducting fluid. And of course, we've got a big magnetic field there. So we get this phenomenon called MHD. So going back to my magnetic field lines here, you can see that this particular field line, if we start on the bottom left hand side here and follow this around the tokamak, you can see we go round once to there, and then twice, and then one last time it comes back on itself three times. And when we get field lines which go around an exact number of times like this and meet back on themselves, we can get a reorganization of the internal magnetic flux inside the machine. So rather than just these lovely nested field lines that you can see here, we end up with these blobs. So a little private bit of magnetic flux where uh, the plasma behaves a little bit differently. And because we saw a field line with n equals three symmetry, you can see one, two, three blobs of magnetic field. So what does this look like? Uh, inside our machine. Well, later on, we can do some really enhanced analysis to get these beautiful uh, field maps to see what it's doing to, to our plasma. But in the control room, we need to make sure it's uh, not uh, damaging our plasma, or if it is, what it actually is and how we can fix it. So we look at uh, uh, pictures like this, which if we press a button, we can do some extra analysis on in the control room. And what this means is if we go back to our field map with the one, two, three blobs. And then we examine our spectrogram on the left. We can see there's an n equals three line there, which is the green one. So we can see that there's one of these n equals three modes in the plasma as given by this green line measurement uh, on the left here. We can see also there's n equals one, two, four. There's a five and a six in here as well, I think. So there's a whole zoo of MHD going on. And we need to be able to examine pictures like this in the control room to work out, firstly, if we've got the physics we wanted to see, and secondly, if we haven't, what knobs we need to twist or tweak uh, to make sure it will work better on the next pulse. And of course, there's a lot more information besides. So this is just a, a whole set of measurements we might be looking at. But I want to draw your attention particularly to that line, which is actually the fusion neutrons. So that, that line is the proof that we're doing nuclear fusion and it actually works. So once we've done all this analysis uh, later on, after the experimental uh, session is over, we'll write it up and hopefully if it's all good work, we get to publish it in one of the peer reviewed journals. So this was uh, the journal paper that came out of that work and with the improved confinement that I said we'd be working at uh, in the beginning. Now, hopefully that's answered your question. What do we actually do when we go to work at Cullen? Um, and I'll happily take some questions now. So let me have a look at the q and I see there's a couple on there already. So um, what I will do is to start off with the uh, first plasma. Sorry, the first plasma, listen to me. I'll start off with the first question uh, from Carl Tischler. Do plasmas always spin in a counterclockwise direction as shown on slide 11? Um, 
it's, it's fairly true to say that plasmas generally spin as a bulk. Um, they don't necessarily go counterclockwise. What usually happens, most tokamaks have a neutral beam heating system. And because those are particle beams which are being fired into the plasma, they impart some momentum to the plasma. Um, so uh, they generally spin in the direction that the neutral beams are being fired in. Now, there are some tokamaks in the world which have beams pointing in both directions, both in the clockwise and counterclockwise direction. So you can actually do some really interesting experiments with those where you balance the momentum both sides and try to stop the plasma spinning at all. Uh, so there, there are uh, some interesting things that, which can be done there. And again, depending on how you set all that up, you get some different physics, different behaviours. And this all goes into the research that we do. So I hope that answers that question. Um, so the next question, what software are we using? Um, so I showed uh, during the, uh, the presentation the use of some software in a couple of places. Uh, a lot of it is designed in-house. It's bespoke, or indeed uh, it's bespoke uh, to Eurofusion Consortium. It will be owned by them. Um, and uh, it's, we, we have um, a very large uh, analysis cluster uh, at Cullum, built, and so there's a lot of parallel computing nodes that we can run these uh, uh, analysis um, tools on. Um, so the first one that I showed, which was uh, to do with the plasma shape design, it's uh, called Proteus, and um, it uh, iteratively solves what's called the garaj shafranov equation, which uh, takes the approximate uh, plasma pressure, uh, it takes the um, plasma current and all the imposed external magnetic fields from the control coils, and works out what that plasma shape is going to be. So that was designed in-house. Then the uh, control software we use to set up the machine parameters, again, that is all uh, completely bespoke software. So what I showed you in this presentation was the session leader interface, um, but uh, that level one software is used to control all of the rest of the um, machine as well. So the engineer in charge has an interface, the diagnostic coordinator, the PSOE, and the heating systems pilots, to name but a few. They all have their own particular interfaces. Um, so uh, occasionally there is something we use uh, off the shelf or a commercial piece of software like ANSYS when we're doing um, engineering analysis. But a lot of what we have to do, uh, the software has to be designed by our own um, software engineering teams. So I hope that has uh, answered that particular question. Okay, so the next question I've got on the list. Um, do we utilize the amount of discharged heat in a sustainable way and how? Now, I'm not surprised at all to see this question. It's very common and uh, you're quite right to ask this question. Um, I'm afraid the simple answer is no, we don't use the uh, discharged heat um, at JET. We actually have some cooling towers at the back of the site with um, a closed water circuit, uh, taking the heat out of the tokamak and discharging it to atmosphere. Now, people get, sometimes get a little bit um, uh, angry at this um, way of operating, but when you look at how much uh, energy actually goes into the tokamak, it's very high power, but for such a short amount of time, it actually represents a fairly small amount of energy. Um, I was talking to uh, the engineer who actually arranges our contract with the national grid a few months ago and he said that uh, we've been using slightly more than the agreed amount of energy over a month uh, previously and it was something like uh, 2,000 units of electricity in that month went into running the jet tokamak so 2,000 units of electricity is 2,000 kilowatt hours and if you look at your home energy bills, you'll find that uh, a, a couple of thousand kilowatt hours is actually fairly close to domestic usage. Well, domestic usage for a number of households, but uh, it's still not a huge amount of, of uh, actual energy. So it just wouldn't be commercially feasible to um, have all the systems to recapture that energy. Of course, in a commercial power plant, it will be useful. That will be industrial levels of energy um, that need to be captured, recirculated, etc., just to improve the efficiency of a power station. So um, uh, future designs where we're actually talking about operational uh, power stations, that will be a big consideration. But for experiments like JET, uh, it's not commercially viable. 
Okay, so uh, I hope that's answered that particular question. So uh, let's move on to the next one, uh, which says, thank you for the presentation. How often do we run an experiment at JET? Um, again, very useful to know. Um, so uh, in an experimental day, uh, we run a two shift system. So we start in the morning at half past six uh, and we run through, we change shifts at about half past two in the afternoon and then the late shift run through to about 10 o'clock at night. Now, during that sh those shifts, we aim to run an experimental pulse about every 30 minutes. That's, uh, that's the main aim. Now, of course, if it's a particularly high power pulse, it may take longer than 30 minutes for the machine to cool down to run the next one. If it's a particularly weedy pulse um, with uh, very low plasma current, not much heating energy, we can run a bit more often. Um, but where you end up with in your, um, uh, in the experimental progression is thinking time. Because after the end of the uh, plasma pulse, it takes about five minutes before we can see any of the data because it all has to be collected, processed and put online for us to access. Um, and then if you're trying to run the next pulse, that means you've got uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes to decide what to do with the next pulse. So um, you can end up being limited by uh, the speed of thought in these particular cases. So um, Generally speaking, uh, 10 experimental pulses on a particular shift is pretty good. Uh, if you're doing less than eight, that's not very good. Uh, if you're getting up to 17 to 20, that's phenomenally good. I have run a shift where we got uh, 18 experimental pulses in one shift. That was a very good day. So that's uh, an experimental day. Um, we run five days a week, Monday to Friday, during an experimental campaign. Um, and we run in particular campaigns. So we, we have a campaign start date and a campaign end date, which might be several months later. Um, but every period is uh, very well planned in advance. So we know exactly when our camp campaigns are. At the moment, uh, we're in a hiatus, of course, because of COVID-19, but we were just coming to the end of campaign C38B, which had been going for two months at that time. And we're planning for C38C, uh, for when we reopen site, hopefully in a couple of weeks time for operations. So watch this space for the restart of experiments. So again, I hope that's uh, answered that particular question. Right, the next one, let's see, uh, a specific question. If we have a plasma with L mode confinement, so that's the, uh, the low confinement mode, how do we go about raising the plasma current when increased input power typically degrades the confinement? Um, okay, so, uh, it's not so much the plasma current that's a problem in this case because of course the central solenoid is operated using a feedback loop. So we program in the amount of plasma current we want to see and then uh, the, uh, the power supply control systems take care of how much flux to inject to keep that plasma current at exactly the right level that we want to see. So that's not particularly the problem. Um, what is a problem, of course, is when uh, the plasma gets hotter uh, and the confinement starts to degrade, how do you get more and more energy stored in the plasma to get it hotter still? Well, this, of course, is part of the research and it's what we were looking at uh, with that uh, publication. So this was, I'll just go back a slide. Is it going to let me? There we go. So this is, this is the slide with the improved confinement. So what we were investigating in this case is uh, if we have a particular magnetic configuration and a particular uh, plasma pressure profile, if we put in a bit more heating power, uh, how do we get improved confinement rather than just losing it all, all that extra heat to uh, uh, confinement degradation? So again, it is an active area of research. You can see this particular paper was from 2015, and this one acted as the basis of a whole slew of new experiments in the current campaigns. So we're still looking at uh, what's this jet high beta plasma is what's now known as the hybrid mode of operation. And of course, the hybrid mode um, experiment has been one of the major uh, parts of the current campaign. So again, there's not uh, the most brilliant answer to that particular question, but I hope it's gone some way to give you some insight into what it is we're actually trying to do. So I'll just, uh, oops, went wrong way. There we go. So I'll just click back to the questions page here. Okay, so I hope that's uh, enough there. Let's see. Uh, next question. Um, I would love to know how the gas first breaks down in the device at the start of the pulse and how it occurs. 
Okay, yeah, this, this is uh, um, the subject actually of a one and a half hour long lecture on the session leader course. So if you uh, were at JET, um, or sorry, at Cullum, and were taking the session leader training course to become a new session leader, you would have to sit through this particular lecture to understand it. So I can give you the couple of sentence answer, but it's a bit involved. Um, what I'll actually do is to uh, find myself the particular uh, slide with the picture of the Tokamak on it. There we go. So what we have um, at the very, very start, we don't have a plasma, as you've uh, quite rightly said. What we do is to form a particular magnetic field using the toroidal field system. Of course, we don't have any poloidal field yet because there's no plasma current. So it's just the toroidal field system. And we make a particular uh, shape of magnetic field right at the start. Uh, which is, uh, well, we, we actually use the shaping coils, sorry, the poloidal field coils. So we end up with, on jet, a hexapolar null. So right in the middle of the machine, we have a zero magnetic field region, which runs round and round inside the plasma. And this is surrounded by uh, the, the hexapolar field, um, sort of a, a nice flowery shaped pattern. So this is the point where we'll do the breakdown. So we squirt in a bit of gas, and we fire up the central solenoid and this causes a large electric field to cross this plasma region. And then we rely on random chance. So by random chance, one of the gas particles that we squirted in will become ionized. Um, this can happen due to a cosmic ray or in uh, some tokamaks they've um, experimented using a, a, um, a high intensity flash lamp to cause these ionizations. Um, some of them will use uh, a little filament on the outside, which will cause a spark and then an ionization like that. Uh, but whichever way you look at it, you end up with an ion in a very large electric field in this null uh, shaped field. So what happens is it gets accelerated round and round in this direction. And because it's in a null, it'll just keep going. And if you shaped this particular field correctly, um, the connection length before we lose that ion can be of the order of several tens of kilometers. So within those several tens of kilometers, it will hit another uh, gas particle and cause that to ionize. So you'll end up with two ions which are being accelerated around. And if you get the conditions right, you get an avalanche ionization effect. Once you've got enough ions going around, you've effectively got uh, enough um, ionized material there to start running a current through it. So you fire up the central solenoid a bit more and you end up with this plasma. We've already got, we then change the field, capture it, and uh, we end up with our tokamak shaped plasma. Okay, so that's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the quick hand wavy explanation. Again, I hope that's uh, answered the, that particular question. Okay, so uh, on to the next question. We have, I read that lithium was being considered to somehow increase confinement of the plasma. Is this true and has it led anywhere? Um, so lithium has been used on uh, other tokamaks. It's not used on jet. Um, I think the place where it was uh, most popular was uh, in NSTX in the United States. So uh, that's a spherical tokamak. So rather, rather like our mast, mast upgrade tokamak at Cullum, there's one called uh, the National Spherical Tokamak Experiment at Princeton in the US. Um, and there they had, it was a little like a pepper shaker. So mounted in the top of the machine, just a, a, little, a, a shaker with powdered lithium in it. And they could press a button and a piezo device would cause it to shake and they'd shake some powdered lithium into the top of the machine. And uh, by doing that, they improved the impurity content of the plasma, which then improved the, uh, the confinement and the reactivity. So it has been looked at and investigated it's not used at JET, but it has, um, I think it's, it's still a, a, a popular bit of research at NSTX. So when they get NSTXU back up and running, I think it'll form part of that um, experimental program as well. Okay, so on to the next one. What are the main benefits of mast topology in comparison with the one of JET? Okay, so this is uh, quite useful to have this particular um, picture still up on the screen here. So this is uh, the, the general sort of ring donut shape of plasma. So if you can imagine this being squeezed inwards, so this central uh, bit may, being made much, much thinner, the plasma being squeezed together, 
uh, you end up with more of a cord apple shape. So I don't have a picture of that in uh, this particular presentation, so you have to imagine the cord apple rather than the ring donut. But what that means is, if, if you look at the toroidal field coils here, um, there's actually quite a bit of a separation um, between the plasma edge and the, uh, the toroidal field coil. If you can get the plasma closer to those toroidal field coils, it means they're experiencing a higher magnetic containment field for the same amount of electricity running through the field coil. So you're making essentially more efficient use of the magnetic field you're generating and making it all smaller in the middle means that's much, much more concentrated. So what you end up with is for the same amount of uh, input uh, current to your containment field, you end up with a a strong containment field across the plasma itself. Um, so this means that if you're making better use of uh, the containment field, you can have higher plasma pressure inside the plasma itself, which is what leads to uh, larger reactivity rates and a better performing plasma. So we call the ratio of this beta. So the beta is the ratio of the uh, plasma pressure to the magnetic field, essentially and spherical tokamaks uh, operate at three times higher beta than conventional tokamaks. So that's uh, essentially, that's the main advantage of uh, the spherical tokamak design and why it's um, such a hot topic of uh, investigation. Okay, so the next question, what's the time period between experiment runs? So uh, I answered in one of the questions earlier that during an experimental day, we're trying to run about once every half an hour. Um, what uh, governs that period mainly is the temperature that these toroidal field coils get to. Now at maximum field strength, we're running 67,000 amps of current through these uh, toroidal field coils. So you can imagine um, that uh, they get pretty hot in a pretty short time scale. You can't operate uh, these things at their maximum current for very long. So, uh, uh, once we've finished the pulse, of course, the, these have got coolant fluid running through them, um, which cools them down. Um, but it takes time to get that heat out. Uh, and depending on what you're going to run for the next pulse, you have to reach um, a minimum temperature before you're allowed to turn them on again. So the interpulse time is principally governed by uh, the temperature in these coils. Now, depending on the experiment you're doing, you can get limitations with other things. For example, one of the big research programs in the last couple of years has been the shattered pellet injector. So this is a thing that creates uh, rather large pellets of uh, hydrogen and deuterium ice uh, to fire into the machine. And it can take time to prepare those ice pellets. So we can be sitting there with the machine all ready to go, uh, but waiting for uh, the shattered pellet injector team to uh, make their ice pellets to go in. So it, it, it depends, but generally speaking, uh, we look at about 30 minutes as the interval time. Okay, the next question, how do we operate the coolant system for the superconductor? I'm afraid this one is well outside my experience um, because uh, you're quite right that superconductors are an important area of research um, in uh, tokamaks. The ITER tokamak being built in the south of France will have superconducting toroidal field coils, but on jet, these are just copper. So all of our magnetic field coils on jets are just copper with coolant fluid running through them. So we don't actually have um, cryogenic systems for these. We do, though, have cryogenic systems elsewhere. So inside here is a very high quality vacuum. And some of the vacuum pumps are made out of panels with liquid helium running through them. So uh, just as in your uh, domestic freezer at home, you get water particles sticking into the freezer element we have uh, liquid helium cooled panels, which act as freezer elements that the uh, deuterium gas sticks to as a very high efficiency uh, vacuum pump. So that's um, uh, one of the places we do use cryogens, um, but uh, generally we don't have to worry about um, getting cryogenic fluids to these things. I believe that ETA tokamak will sit inside a big cryostat, so the whole thing will be immersed in a cryostat. So it's really interesting engineering. If you go to the ETA website, I'm sure there'll be some more information on that. So you just let me go back to the final slide here again, just for those sorts of bits of information. So eurofusion.org is where to go to see the uh, ETA specifications. Right, 
So moving on, so next question. In the case of an emergency, which safety system or ESD system do you use? Okay, so the word emergency covers a whole gamut of, of possible things here. Um, so uh, in the sense of emergency, uh, I guess you would be talking about some sort of breach of the containment vessel or otherwise. Um, and in this case, we have lots and lots of um, automatic shutdowns and uh, particularly if we're using tritium gas, we have um, lots and lots of safety systems involved there which are bespoke to the design of the machine. So they will, they're all being automatically monitored and they will be flipped into safe states the moment any anomaly is uh, detected. When we're talking about um, running the machine itself, uh, we looked at, uh, if I go back to the particular slide, here we go with my level so one software on it. Uh, now, if you look here, we've got uh, PIW, so the protection of the eater like wall system. Um, can I actually, can I go through to the PIW here? Let's see if I can or not. So if I run this right through to the end, bear with me half a second. You can see the level one so software. Oh, oh, it ran off. How terrible. Um, but you can see on there, we were about here in the, in the system. So you can see all sorts of things along the top here. So we, we've got things that can happen. So slow, fast, MHD2, MHD. So if we get particular uh, things like MHD modes developing, which are too large, then we have a series of responses that uh, we can use, which are basically a different plasma shape with different heating schemes, a ramp down of the plasma current, a ramp down of the magnetic field. So basically a safe shutdown. Um, of course, we've got quite a lot of experience in how these things can happen. So we designed lots of uh, scenarios that we know will be safe, shutting the plasma down under particular scenarios if particular unexpected things happen. So um, that's essentially what all this stuff does. So there's, there's different types of emergencies. So things that might go wrong with the plasma, so the physics itself, and we use the machine and our experience to keep it safe that way. Or if something happens with the hardware, we have some uh, very serious industry standard uh, methodologies for keeping the plant safe. Okay, so that was uh, quite a fun one. Let's uh, go on to, uh, again, I'll pop that back onto the final slide. So next question, do we have an ideal shape for the magnetic field and electric current, which we intend to achieve by running these experiments? Any idea how many experiments we must run to achieve it? Okay, uh, so, the ideal shape for the field and current, I'm guessing, is uh, partially related to, oh, well, we've got it, got it here. So this is the, uh, the current in red on the top graph. Oh, sorry, let me get my laser pointer back up. We can see what we're talking about. So the plasma current in red on the top graph and the toroidal field in blue. So you can see they've got a particular ratio there. And that ratio is quite important because it determines um, the helicity of the magnetic field lines that we've seen on other slides in this experiment. Um, what's also very important is the shape of these across the plasma profile. So the uh, differences that you experience in uh, the magnitude of these as you travel from the very core of the plasma out to the, the plasma edge. Um, and this experiment in particular, uh, the, the improved confinement mode, was looking um, at how to shape those uh, in particular to get that improvement in confinement. So this experiment was in fact all about this particular question, how we shape the magnetic field and electric current across the plasma profile. And a lot of this is to do with how we start this um, field up in the first place, how we start the plasma current up, the ratio of those as we develop towards this point, how we gas it. So this is the gas going in here and this, this uh, puff of gas at the beginning is very important and timed very carefully with respect to the heating systems. So all these things timed together is very important to get that shape that we wanted um, to, uh, to, to end up with that uh, particular organized system of improved confinement. So no, we, we, we do have uh, 
particular ideal shapes. This is one of them. There's another theory of design. This is called the hybrid mode of plasma, but the other one's called the baseline mode of plasma. Uh, they work under um, slightly different uh, parts of the physics parameter space, but they have different advantages. Um, any idea how many experiments we need to achieve this? This is uh, not really something that's known. Um, so during the C38 campaign, um, each of the baseline and hybrid mode experiments were allocated 28 full experimental sessions each, which is a huge amount of experimental sessions. Um, but each session designed to execute a particular investigation into aspects of how to set this up uh, better. With the aim, uh, hopefully um, later this year, of running tritium in the machine again and a full DTE2 run very soon and proving that we can actually uh, make a plasma that is uh, reactor relevant and will demonstrate the, uh, the power out that uh, we think that we can make it produce. So again, I hope that has uh, gone some way to answering that particular question. Okay, next, what uh, has the physical problem? Make it this, so what are the physical problems to make this a power plant technology? Now, um, if I can just uh, use this as an advert for next week's webinar, uh, so my colleague Chantal Nobbs will be uh, presenting another webinar with the title Neutrons in Fusion, Powerful but Troublesome. Now we've seen in this presentation that neutrons are the things that we want to uh, produce. They're the things that carry the energy out and that we will collect to uh, be the energy source for our power station. But high energy neutrons cause problems in materials. So uh, this uh, particular uh, webinar will, I think, go into some of the details about what trouble uh, we have designing the materials that we need um, to make tokamaks out of. So that's one of the things that's difficult. Uh, there are a number of other things besides. So we have a whole department um, at Cullum, the technology department, which are looking into these specific uh, sorts of questions, even to the extent of uh, will a future power plant need neutral beam heating systems, for example. Neutral beams are very expensive to run in terms of their um, the power that they require to run and the size of the nuclear island. So you saw on the earlier slide that the neutral beam systems were a similar size to the tokamak itself. So if we can do away with those, yes, we've, we've made a huge saving in terms of the complexity of our power station. If we need them, can we still make the power station uh, wall plug efficient? So the total amount of power we need in to run it compared to the amount of power it will produce and put on the grid. So there's a lot of these technological aspects. Uh, so uh, materials, the technology we need to, to go in to run it, how we make it self-sufficient in tritium gas, for example, um, and uh, a whole uh, plethora of things besides. Um, if you go onto our website, um, again, these uh, things are discussed in a bit more detail. So ccfe.ukaa.uk. Okay, so. Next one, does the machine get unexpectedly damaged from time to time? Um, yes, this can happen. Um, like I've said on several occasions, it is an experimental machine. And here's one of the ways in which it can get damaged and indeed why we have to take such a lot of care with it. So on this particular slide, you can see the infrared view of the inner wall. And uh, in particular, the top bit here, you can see this is a fairly triangular plasma. This is a, a fairly sharp point on the equilibrium here. So this plasma is getting quite close to the top of the machine and it's depositing quite a lot of heat there. Now, if for some reason this got a bit pointier than we were expecting and this uh, gap got a bit smaller than we were expecting, this would get hotter. Now these tiles are made out of beryllium. They've got a melting point of about 1200 degrees. So although on this particular slide it's, it's about within its operational uh, parameter space, you can imagine that it wouldn't take very much for it to go beyond that particular parameter space. Um, and we have in fact, uh, in um, some experiments, we're always trying to push the envelope, of course. There's no point operating in the middle of your parameter space. You want to be doing your research right at the edge. So when we get a bit too close to the edge, sometimes we have seen a little bit of melting on the top here. And indeed the limiters on the outside, you can see where they're getting hot. You can see some melting on there. There was actually an experiment early on with the eater-like wall back in 2013, I think it was, where we actually did an experiment to purposefully melt uh, one little part of the diverter in the bottom of the machine. So you can see where it's getting really hot in the middle here. We put the strike point in a particular position 
we left it there and we applied enough extra heating power that we knew we were going to take that tungsten tile beyond its, its uh, melting point. So we have in fact damaged the machine on purpose to research what happens when we damage a machine. So uh, yes, we can do it by accident. We also have experimental programs to do it on purpose. So um, externally, the, uh, the, the systems that the machine is made of are fairly um, uh, robust technology, all of it. Um, a lot of it's getting quite old now, of course. Uh, Jet first operated in 1983, so you do the maths, it's getting quite old. Uh, is jet, but it was um, engineered so well in the first place that we're still getting very, very good physics out of it all these decades later. Um, but you know, things do break down, and that's part of why we have such a huge team of very talented engineers to put it all back together and keep it going for us. Um, so uh, that's uh, that question answered, I hope. Um, the next one is Will we share this presentation? Um, I'm, I think we're still recording, so yes, assuming the recording all went all right it will be put up on our YouTube channel um, in some days time after uh, the graphics team have had a go at it and made sure it's all uh, looking okay. So um, yes, it will be there for future reference. And of course, the previous webinars are up on the YouTube channel already. So next, uh, do the poloidal and toroidal field coils configure the plasma whilst the solenoid generates a current that accelerates the plasma? Yes, that's basically it. So again, if I can go back to the Tokamak design, uh, where's the basic one? There it is. So yes, so the, uh, the, the central solenoid uh, by transformer action generates the plasma current. So the central solenoid here has about 80,000 turns in it. So that's the coil going round and round there. Uh, we run up to 40 kiloamps through these and by transformer action, when we've got 80,000 turns to one turn in the plasma, yeah, we can, uh, historically, we can generate up to seven mega amps of plasma current. Um, so that's what the central solenoid there is for. It does have uh, an amount of uh, magnetic field associated for it, which leaks across into the plasma. But we can account for that in the design software um, uh, when we're designing the shape. The toroidal field coils are the ones that um, principally generate um, just a, a, a the toroidal field coil here. Um, and that's a fairly simple shape of field. It's strong at the inner edge and just uh, as inverse square, it drops to the outer edge. Then uh, where's my other slide? It was here, I believe. There, that one. And then we have all these extra um, poloidal field coils in here. So we've got the diverter ones. There's four diverter field coils in here to create that X point and position those strike points exactly. The P4 coils essentially uh, define where the outer edge of the plasma is and they uh, control the vertical movement. So they, these are the ones that really are connected to the feedback loop to control the position of the plasma. And then these other ones uh, control the, the elongation of the plasma and the triangularity of the plasma. There's also, by having a connected circuit in the central solenoid, this effectively acts as an extra magnetic field coil on the high field side, which we can use to push on the inner edge of the plasma to define that separation in the center. So yes, that's essentially uh, what it does. So again, I hope that's answered that particular question. So the next one, pulse preparation looks delicate and has to be calibrated properly. Yes, that's uh, an understatement, I think. Is there some sort of driving license class to train the new generation? Yes, indeed there is. Um, so we are actually running a training program at the moment. Um, I did my training program back in 2010. So the first part of that is to sit uh, through a whole load of training lectures, um, which teach you about the operation principles and how to choose the parameters, how to set them up in the software, etc. cetera. Um, but you cannot learn everything from uh, sitting in lectures and courses. You actually have to do the job to learn how to do it. So once you set, set all the lectures, um, there used to be a, a short exam that you had to take to prove you'd taken it all in. Uh, but assuming you get selected to actually start practical training, you get given a trainee license. Now licenses uh, define what the maximum plasma current is that you're allowed to run in the machine. A trainee license allows you to run 30 kilaps, so basically nothing. Um, 
a plasma of 30 kiloamps is actually detected as no plasma by the, the uh, control systems. So the trainee license allows you access to all the, the uh, um, software to learn to use the software, but it doesn't actually let you run a plasma. So when you're in the control room as a trainee, you have to have um, an experienced session leader sitting with you, and it's their license which you use to run the plasma. Now, once you've done maybe about uh, 20 to 30 shifts as a trainee, you can be awarded your first level license, which is a two mega amp license. And that allows you to run plasmas up to two mega amps. And again, you'll have to do a certain number of uh, shifts, uh, both with experienced session leaders sitting with you and uh, a certain amount of solo shifts as well to prove that you can actually do the job by yourself. And once you've done again 20 to 30 shifts, you'll be awarded the next le level license, which is three mega amp. And again, after a similar, similar amount of time, you get the next level license, which is uh, a four mega amp license. So that's the that's, uh, four mega amp or fully trained. So that's the license level that I reached last year after starting out in 2010. Um, there is one level beyond that, which is expert. And there are only, I think, two people left with an expert level license. Uh, and uh, uh, at least one of these people has been running the machine since it was uh, first set up. Uh, and the other expert session leader license holder, um, again, has been doing the job for many, many years and runs the uh, unit which holds the plasma operations group, amongst others. So yes, it's very, very carefully controlled. There's a lot of work to go into training to run the machine. A lot of fun though, and definitely worth doing. Okay, uh, next one, uh, what starts the fuel injection? So uh, if we just go back to the slide with the, the gas system on it. There we go, so these are all the gas introduction modules. So each of these is a piezo valve, so it's uh, a, a gas reservoir with a piezo crystal sealing off the gas pipe, and then we can apply a voltage to the piezo crystal to open it by a very defined amount and get a very specific gas flow through each of these gas introduction modules. So at the very start of the pulse, generally we use GIM1 or GIM2 to puff in uh, a little tiny bit of gas for the breakdown. We discussed the breakdown in a question earlier on. Um, and then as soon as we got breakdown, we have to fuel, continue fueling uh, the plasma. At least one of the valves has to be connected to a feedback loop. So we define uh, the plasma density that we want to see throughout um, the pulse. Uh, I showed that. Where did I show that earlier? Um, sorry, I can't find the slide. Where are I? Uh, is it this one? No, anyway, uh, it's not, not particularly important, but uh, we need to um, then define the density against time that we want to see. We connect up the feedback loop. We have a big diagnostic system that provides us a measurement of the density in real time, and then the feedback loop acts to uh, control that uh, particular gym to puff in gas as we need it. And then when we go into H mode, high confinement mode, generally we'll program different uh, gyms to produce uh, different gases. So if I look at the very end here, you can see this particular um, profile of gas injection here. So this is uh, the feedback loop working up to this point, and then we program in an opening of one of the gas introduction modules. And then again at the end of the experimental phase here. So it's all very, very carefully programmed and connected to automatic controls. Okay, so how frequent will the lecture for becoming a session leader be open? Not very frequently. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort to train people to be session leaders. Uh, so there was a course in 2010. I think the next one was run in 2015, which uh, gave a slew of new session leaders. Uh, we're running another um, set at the moment. Um, it's not really the lecture course that's the problem um, so much as the machine time. So I've said it takes uh, 20 to 30 sessions for someone to um, increase their license level. Now if you think of the number of session leaders we need to train versus the number of sessions available, we can only have one trainee per session. Um, it's just uh, the time is very very limited to be able to train people. And of course, it's absolutely imperative that we keep people going through this system because the next machine eater will need session leaders. It will need people who now know how to drive tokamaks. They'll have to, be, have to have been trained on uh, similar scale machines. So machines like JET, uh, the JT60U 
over in Japan at the moment, which again, actually is a very interesting one that because it's got superconducting coils. So the technology is a, that little bit close to each other as well. But people will have to have trained on these machines in order to have a chance of being uh, competent enough to drive ITER. Okay, so uh, let's run on to the next question. Why does JET use ICRH and not ECRH for heating? Um, I believe it's to do with the penetration for heating. Um, ECRH is quite sensitive to the plasma density. And beyond a particular density level, you, uh, you can't get the ECRH um, past the periphery of the plasma. What we generally want to do is to heat the center of the plasma. So we, that's the reason for the particular frequencies of RF that we have available to us so that we can place the resonances right in the core of the plasma. Um, it's also the reasoning for the choice behind the injection energy of the neutral beams, because the, the uh, particular particles we use in neutral beam heating have to be of a particular energy to penetrate to the core of the plasma. So uh, the, the, this is generally what, the, what governs the choice of uh, particular heating systems is um, which bit of the parameter space we're envisaging working at most frequently. Okay, next, what kind of disruption mitigation system is used on jets and how often do we do experiments on that? Yeah, this is a, a particularly relevant topic. Um, so uh, historically, disruption mitigation was done by detecting uh, an imminent disruption. Uh, for those listening who don't know, a disruption is where we end up usually with uh, MHD modes which disrupt our control of the plasma vertical position. So we lose control of the plasma and it bangs into the wall. So that's what we call a disruption. Um, nasty things, they can cause the plasma to extinguish itself in uh, a time scale of hundreds of milliseconds. And of course, a large current disappearing in hundreds of milliseconds in a very large magnetic field causes a huge force. Uh, and on jet, it can actually make the machine jump in the air with a force of um, three to 400 tons. Um, very exciting things. But so of course, you want to be careful about them. So disruption mitigation, when, when we detected them, um, we put jet into a safe shutdown mode and tried to shut down the plasma before the disruption occurred. Um, later on with the ETA light wall, of course, it was recognized that its disruption was much more damaging to the wall potentially. So we tested new disruption mitigation techniques. The first was the disruption mitigation valve. So we have a reservoir with uh, eight to 10 bar liters of uh, gas sitting in it at uh, between um, usually two and 30 bar pressure. And if a disruption is detected to be uh, uh, occurring by the automatic systems, it will just open up the gas valve and dump that gas into the machine. And that huge gas injection causes all the energy in the plasma to be radiated away. And if you get it right, then you can radiate most of the energy away before the plasma hits the wall. and You end up with a much less damaging disruption. Now this was found to be so successful that uh, use of disruption mitigation valves are now mandatory on JET. Whereas it was once an experiment, we now have to use them all the time. Um, and in the last campaign, we've been testing the shattered pellet injector, which is itself a disruption mitigation system. And it's a big test for ITER, which will have SPI systems mounted on it, um, assuming that we uh, prove their efficacy in the current program. And this is essentially a large, um, ice pellet, which we fire into the machine at high speed, the ice shatters, and of course the shattering produces large gas puffs throughout the entire plasma profile. So rather than firing the gas in at the edge as gas and letting it diffuse into the plasma, the SPI is uh, intended to deliver a large shot of very cold gas right into the plasma core. So it should be a much more effective uh, disruption mitigation system. Experiments on that are still ongoing, and uh, we're hoping for an extension uh, another extension to JET after DTE2, which will partially be for testing uh, more SPI concepts for ITER. So next, uh, we're getting through them. The number of questions is gradually going down. Um, so during operation, will an electric field be produced? If so, what's the effect of the confinement rate? So there is an electric field on JET. Um, uh, again, it's not, not one of my uh, particular areas of expertise because you get um, a radial electric field, which is, uh, a particular um, feature of plasmas and particularly um, uh, important in forming the H mode at the edge. So 
but uh, essentially the central solenoid here causes an electric field across the plasma. So uh, uh, it's necessary to have that electric field to accelerate the particles around and produce the plasma current. So it's all uh, very, in, all, all the electromagnetics of this are all very intimately linked. Um, but of course, once you form the plasma, um, it, uh, it has uh, other electric fields associated with it other than the, that generated by the central solenoid. So um, there's no substitute for going and reading up on these things, I'm afraid. <laughs> so uh, please try it. Find yourself a, a, a text on Tokamax and have a read about the electric fields that uh, occur inside them. So thank you for that one. So the age-old question, when are we likely to see practical commercial fusion energy? There are some companies claim this could be before demo. Is this actually likely? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, there's been a resurgence in uh, recent years for privately invested uh, fusion energy research. And yes, indeed, some of those companies are claiming that they can put energy on the grid in very short time scales, uh, even before uh, the ETA program has reached its DT stage. Um, all I can say is about the, the, the branch I work on within uh, JET, UKAEA and Eurofusion is that we have a roadmap. It's a realistic roadmap based on the Tokamak concept. Um, and in that roadmap, we have ETA operations starting in 2025 and uh, getting to DT operations, I think, in 2035. That was the, the last timescale I saw. And that should answer the, enough of the, the remaining questions that will allow us to work on demo. And in the meantime, working on all the technology points uh, that are also um, in parallel. So we had a question earlier on what other technology needs to be developed. So that's all being worked on in parallel, hopefully to be to culminate in demo at the end of it. So that's, that's a roadmap that, uh, I see as feasible. We also at UKAA have the STEP program, so the Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production, which is a fairly recent thing. You may have seen um, last year the government announced uh, a £200 million investment um, for this particular project. So the, initially the STEP project is a five-year project to design a viable uh, commercial um, power station built around the spherical Tokamak concept, so using our experience with uh, start, mast, and mast U to produce a viable design. So by 2025, we should have a viable design for a spherical tokamak energy uh, power plant. Now that, of course, gets us the paper. It gets us the paperwork, the design, what we need to actually build. If it proves that we can uh, produce a viable design, we will then move on to the next uh, stage of that particular project, which will be to build it. So the building of that particular um, design will then be years after that. So this itself is beyond the time scale that some of the private investment companies uh, say they can do it on. Now, if they can, I say fantastic. Um, I, I love the fact there's so much uh, effort, thought, and indeed resources being poured into these questions and from so many different uh, angles, it can only enrich the research and the body of knowledge around nuclear fusion. So. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to see that it's all there. Uh, as for timescales, I think the I think the most realistic ones are the ones that uh, we're working to at UKAA. Okay, so can I ask how I got involved in fusion? And sorry, this is you, but it means I. Uh, what you know, I had to study to get involved at Cohen. So I had a, a slightly unconventional route into nuclear fusion, a fairly standard way. If you're looking to do uh, the science research is to uh, do physics at university and then apply for a PhD program that's related to fusion. So we usually have about um, 30 or 40 PhD students based at Cullum uh, pursuing various angles of fusion research for their doctorate. Um, once they've completed their doctorate, of course, they either uh, start working in uh, our partner labs, partner universities, or as full-time employee at uh, Cullum itself. Uh, personally, I did a PhD in um, surface science and nanotechnology, so it's completely unrelated to fusion. But by the time I'd finished that particular PhD, my enthusiasm for that particular topic had waned somewhat. And I had uh, seen a presentation about JET at a conference fairly recently. Um, so I applied to Cullum as a completely inexperienced uh, researcher. So experience in doing science research, but no experience in fusion at all. And I was lucky enough that uh, uh, one of the scientists at uh, Cullum 
was trying to expand their group uh, and liked the idea of having someone with no particular um, uh, preconceived interest or idea to take on. So um, I, was, I was lucky to be taken on into that role. And now, what is it, over 17 years later, I'm now head of the group that I was uh, brought into um, back in the back in late 2002. So it was uh, an interesting route in, but there are some fairly standard routes. Um, if you look at our website again, I'll just uh, move back to the uh, final slide for the address. Um, you can find, uh, I believe, something about careers at uh, UKAA and Infusion on our website. Okay, so uh, questions are diminishing. Excellent, let's see. Uh, I've read that fuel used here is deuterium and tritium. How are we producing tritium in huge quantity? So we don't produce tritium at uh, Cullum. Um, we have a stock of tritium that we've bought in um, under a license from, I believe it's Canada. There's particular types of um, fission reactor in Canada which produce tritium as a byproduct. So we bought our tritium and we keep it in storage at Cullum. Um, we only get it out on special occasions, so we've done tritium experiments in 1991, 1997 and 2003. And we haven't done tritium experiments in all the time since 2003. This is one of the reasons why DTE2, slated for uh, late this year and early next year, is so exciting because it will be the first tritium experiments for 17 or 18 years. Uh, and that's in the world. Um, JET is the only machine capable of running with tritium gas. Um, so. We have an amount of tritium, but of course it gets recycled. When we puff it into the machine, um, only a, a minuscule amount actually gets used up in fusion reactions and the rest gets pumped away uh, into, by the vacuum pumps. So once we collect up all the exhaust gas, we can split it back out in, into its component deuterium and tritium, recycle the tritium through the machine. So we don't actually need to keep very much to do experiments on it. Um, in commercial reactors, of course, it will use up the tritium and uh, part of the research is tritium breeding. So how we make more tritium uh, by uh, utilizing the very energetic neutrons that come out of the reaction. Um, so you can use those to breed tritium out of uh, a lithium blanket uh, surrounding the machine. So that's how um, these things will be self-sufficient in their fuel. Deuterium, of course, is 0.015% uh, of all hydrogen. So you can just strain that out of seawater. There's um, tens of thousands of years of that available at current energy needs. Okay, uh, how does JET compare to ITER currently under development? Will JET still be used once ITER is operational? Um, so in terms of comparison, ITER is about twice the size in every linear dimension. So the plasma volume is about 10 times the size. Um, so uh, being bigger, it means you get uh, better confinement properties. So the particles are confined for a longer period of time, meaning they get more chance to react. And you can get, uh, because you can get more reactions coming out, you should get a better multiplication of energy into energy out. Now JET, of course, was never designed to produce net energy. It's a physics experiment, albeit a very large one. Um, and it holds the record for energy out to energy in. We produced 16 megawatts of neutron power coming out, uh, but it took 25 megawatts of energy into the plasma to produce it. So we had an energy factor of two thirds. ETA is designed to have an energy amplification factor of 10. So that is the principal bottom line difference. ITER should produce net energy. But this is net physics energy. ITER is still an experiment. So if you look at the wall plug efficiency, how much uh, energy it will take to run all of the plant um, to produce it, it still won't produce net energy to a grid. It will be net a demonstration that the plasma itself can produce net energy. After that, demo will then be designed to produce net wall plug efficiency. So it will be able to put power onto a grid. But at the moment, we're still in physics experiment stages. Uh, will JET still be used once ITER is operational? Um, well, that's a question. Um, no one really knows what we're going to be doing with JET after uh, ITER starts up. Um, of course, uh, on original timelines, ITER was uh, slated to start some years ago, but um, due to uh, various factors. Um, we're not expecting ITER to start until 2025. So in the time that uh, we've been uh, getting ITER built, um, we've been able to do many, many more experiments with JET and we've, we've produced new science and uh, 
we know a lot more now than we, we did 10 years ago. So jet is continually proving its worth. So really, I think what it will come down to is uh, when we have an actual start date for ETA, and, it's, and that's approaching, what the ideas are for JET, what we think we might be able to do with it, where it might be able to still contribute to the science or to technology. If those are good ideas, then uh, someone will produce the funding to do it. If the ideas aren't good enough and we can do all this with ETA, then the money will be put onto ETA for better use. There's a finite amount of money, we have to do the best we can with it. So uh, I think it really comes down to uh, the timing and the ideas and where the science is at at that particular stage. So I'd like it to keep going for a while. I, it's, a, it's a beautiful machine and uh, I think it's really punched above its weight for its entire lifetime. Okay, Okay. next question. Uh, what's RAF MS steel material used in this project? Um, I'm not entirely sure what that particular acronym is. I'm afraid I'm a physicist rather than uh, an engineer, but um, in terms of the steel, uh, for the vacuum vessel, we use uh, high-grade vacuum uh, steel, so it doesn't leach any impurities um, into the vacuum environment. Um, we use uh, other types of materials, Inconel, which is, uh, uh, I think, a high nickel content steel. Um, there's um, uh, various other alloys that we use as well, which um, are chosen partly for their um, uh, material properties, so the rigidity, but we also have to consider what their radiological properties are as well. So as there's a lot of uh, neutrons flying around, is there any constituent of the material that gets activated and therefore becomes radioactive? Uh, the answer is yes, but most of the stuff that we use, um, the radioisotopes produced have very short half-lives. So the radiation dies away on a very short time scale of a couple of years. Uh, so this is the major advantage we have over fission plants, where the, the waste lasts tens of thousands of years, the waste from fusion, um, lasts for a number of years. It's certainly something you can deal with on conventional timescales. Um, but yes, it, it, it depends where the particular material is, uh, how close it is to the plasma, and uh, it, the, the properties we need from it. Okay, on some of the slides it looks like there's a cross in the field lines at the bottom of the machine. What is this and how does it happen? So yes, you're quite right. This is the X point. Um, if I get this particular slide up and run through it. Let's see, there we are. So here's a couple, some equilibria and the cross you're talking about is in the bottom here. So this is the, uh, the X point and it's made by four poloidal field coils we have. So one here, one here, one here, and one on the outboard edge there. So we fire those up in a particular uh, ratio and we form this particular region here. What this does is it allows us to force the only interaction between the hot plasma and a material in the bottom. So where these strike points sit is the only material plasma interface. You can see around the rest of the machine, there's a gap all the way around the plasma. Uh, so what we do is we've made the diverter region here out of tungsten tiles. So tungsten has a melting point of three and a half thousand degrees compared with the rest of the machine, which is made of beryllium tiles with a melting point of 1200 degrees. Now the reason we can do that is this private flux region in the bottom tends to prevent any spotted material out the diverter from getting into the main plasma. So uh, we can shield the tungsten influx that you get due to the uh, sputtering in the diverter from the main plasma. So this is one of the things it's for, but um, the, the, the principally it allows us to get the, uh, the uh, plasma into H mode, the high confinement mode of uh, operation. It's first done in Aztecs uh, many, many years ago. I can't remember the exact date, but the, I think it was only uh, a couple of years ago that uh, there was a special issue of one of our usual journals, which was celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Aztecs H mode experiment. So uh, if you look up Aztecs and H mode, you should be able to find a bit more information about that on the web. It's very interesting stuff. But that's the purpose of the X point and uh, how we form it. Okay, so next, uh, how can additive manufacturing contribute to the improvement of the system? Um, again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a materials engineer, so additive manufacturing is certainly not my area of expertise. Um, but yes, it, it, it is something that's, that's uh, uh, being actively researched by the technology department. And if there's a particular advantage to using it um, and it, it produces better materials or cheaper materials or combinations of the above, 
then certainly it will be used as one of the manufacturing techniques. Um, one of the other things I sometimes get asked is 3D printing. Do we have any 3D printing technology? Yes, we certainly do. There's a number of 3D printers on site. Uh, they've all been diverted to producing PPE for the NHS at the moment, but uh, they, they form uh, part of the backbone of some of our technology uh, research. So next, uh, is there any interface from the different magnetic fields that could affect the confinement? When developing new components, is magnetic compatibility a key design driver for tokamak components? Um, yes, indeed, the, the, there is some particular uh, consideration here. I can go to uh, one of my other slides, which was, uh, where was I? Oh, it was this one. Let's wind it back a bit. There we go. So, um, yes, all, the, all these fields interact, but of course, um, they all are used as inputs into the code that I showed earlier uh, to determine the uh, shape, position, and the control parameters we use for each of our plasmas. So JET is um, quite unique in the tokamak world. We've actually got a soft iron core all the way down the center of the machine here. It's completely passive. It's not connected up to any electrical circuit, but just the having a soft iron core here means that it gets magnetized when we turn the machine on and that affects the shapes of the uh, magnetic fields uh, that we end up with in the machine. So yes, uh, ITER itself is designed with passive elements on the outer edges. So you, the plasma will induce electric currents in passive components running around the outside of the machine. These will produce their own magnetic fields and they can help to stabilize some of the MHD modes. So those things I talked about towards the end of the webinar. Um, uh, so this is all very important and again there's a lot we do know about it but there's still stuff we don't know so research into how well these sorts of uh, passive components might work for us is again still part of active research. Okay uh, in one of the graphs shown I point out that one of its features is fusion neutrons. What is it about that graph that shows it in this case? Okay well, let's go back to that particular graph it was right at the end of the, the talk here. Okay so what we've got here is a line, just a line. Uh, it's a number of neutrons hitting a detector versus time. So here we've got a scale that goes one, two, two and a half, two and a half times 10 to the 16 neutrons per second. So at this detector, which is mounted outside the machine, it's detecting neutrons with a particular energy uh, hitting its detector. Now the energy it's tuned to is the specific energy of neutrons that come out of this reaction. So in a deuterium only reaction, this neutron has an energy of 2.4 mega electron volts. So this detector is detecting the number of neutrons hitting it at 2.4 mega electron volts. So it's, it's a proxy for the amount of fusion reactions that are going on inside the machine. And inside this, uh, this, this particular experiment, you can see when the additional heating comes on here. So these are the neutral beams. And they last until this point, about 52 seconds. And the fusion neutron rate suddenly goes up. And then we hit an MHD mode. That's these things here. That's a measure of the amplitude of the MHD. And it all suddenly drops off. So the, the confinement's gone wrong as a particular piece of MHD has got larger and degraded the confinement. Um, but essentially, the, the neutrons are the things that will carry the energy out of the plasma that we will collect and run our power station. So this is the basic figure of merit of how well uh, the, the experiment has run. Okay, so next question. The amount of electric power that the project takes from the grid when it starts can cause an intermittent frequency on the city grid. Yes, it can. Um, so this was where I was talking earlier. I can go back to the slide about the job of the power supplies operations engineer. Uh, where's he gone? He's uh, in here somewhere. There we go. So this is the, 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 the power supplies operations engineers uh, slide um, and this graph of the world record energy pickup in 1990. So JET's power demand is 575 megawatts. So this scale here is in gigawatts. So JET is about half of one of these divisions on here, maximum. So the point is, you can see the end of extra time pickup here was 300 megawatts. It's, it's, it's big, um, but uh, uh, jet is of that kind of scale when we turn it on. 
Now, of course, if we don't have any spinning reserve on the grid to uh, account for jet, and we usually don't, then what you generally see happen is that the frequency of, on the national grid, which is supposed to be at 50 hertz, or as close to it as absolutely possible, drops from about 50 hertz by about 0 0.03 or 0 0.04. So you'll go from 50 hertz down to 49.096-ish. So it's not a huge, hugely noticeable thing on the national grid in terms of the frequency, but you can just about see it. Um, but of course, if, uh, if the demand is peaking like this, and then the national grid control room gets a signal to say we're about to start a jet pulse, they actually have a button in the control room they can press and stop jet operating. So uh, if they determine they're having a bit of an issue, they can actually directly stop our experiment. So it's a, it's a bit annoying when it happens, but we understand why, and it's part of our contract. Uh, so two questions left to go. Uh, do we think it's commercial to produce electricity by fusion? And did anyone calculate a break-even point for oil price that produce electricity? Um, yes, this, again, this is a, a whole presentation in itself. Uh, there is one of my colleagues who does this presentation. I don't know if it's available anywhere. Um, but these considerations uh, have been done. It's uh, an offshoot of the technology department where they consider um, uh, the, the full cost cycles of uh, producing a power plant. And indeed, we have um, some fairly large systems engineering codes where um, uh, cost balance and break even is uh, one of the one of the inputs one of the outputs of those particular codes so a lot is known about it um, but I'm afraid I don't have the material here to show you anything in detail right okay uh, we'll make this one the last question we mentioned uh, it consumes 575 megawatts how much energy would it produce and how much how would it be harnessed to power the grid okay um, as I've said on a number of occasions through these questions jet is a physics experiment. It was never designed to produce energy. Um, when we get to things like uh, ITER and DEMO, what we're looking at uh, is maybe a power plant that produces, just ballpark figure, um, four gigawatts of net energy in terms of fusion reactions, but it might take two gigawatts of electricity to run the plant. So we'd be looking at producing maybe four gigawatts of total fusion energy, but supplying two gigawatts to the national grid. So these sorts of uh, considerations are all taken into account. I just mentioned the, um, the systems engineering code that the technology department look after and uh, develop. And again, these are the sorts of considerations that go in there. So if, if we needed a power plant to produce um, 100 gigawatts of fusion energy and it produced one megawatt of electricity, I don't think that would be commercially viable. So we need to make sure that these figures are correct and uh, feasible and that they make sense economically. Right, so we've come to the end of the question, 38 questions, 39 questions even. So that was, uh, that was quite a lot of fun. Thank you very much everyone for all of that. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this and that everyone's got everything they wanted to out of this particular presentation. Uh, and if you need to see any of it again, it should be uh, put up onto our YouTube channel soon. So thank you all very much for joining. And uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, speak to you all. Thank you very much.